youngest sister integrated the third grade. I knew people integrated the first. The thing that became interesting and profound in all those experiences, because when I integrated that sixth grade class, I had teachers, I should say a teacher, would never ever have a black student in her classroom. Lord have mercy. They thought that every black student was superior. They thought that every black student that entered there did not deserve to be in that class. They didn't want to see you there. If you came near them and you reached out your hand, they didn't want to touch you. They were of an opinion that you were inferior. You were just a step above a monkey on the evolutionary scale. Lord help us. That was the perception. So when you went to that classroom, you were forming and shaping opinions, not just for yourself, but you were placing and trying to shape opinions about an entire race so that people would understand that African-American students were potential to excel, that African-American students were equivalent and better in some areas than black students, that we could excel someplace other than the basketball court, someplace other than a baseball field, someplace other than a child. My parents provided support. I was living in a multicultural environment. And when I say that, because of the civil rights movement, our home became a mecca for all those that were involved. Yeah. We came to Durham and was first throughout the state of North Carolina that were active in bringing about fundamental social change. People like Carol Silver, who was Jewish, was a Stanford educated lawyer who worked in the past law office lived in our home for about two and a half to three years. People like Shane Long came from a very prominent family up in Connecticut. It was wife who came and was active in organizing demonstrations throughout eastern North Carolina and western North Carolina as well. People like Moon Ng, Chinese, came and probably spent about a little a year and a half at the bottom of my own bed, and I stayed at the top. <laughs> Ike Reynolds, active in floor, bill secretary. I could go on and on. It was a multicultural environment that I lived in, in the heart of the segregated South. In a home where each and every day, calls would come in that were threatening calls, threatening to bomb that house. From the time I was about in fourth grade, all the way up through eighth grade, Every night from dusk to dawn until the break of dawn. Through those dark hours, we had three or four people sitting on that front porch each and every night with guns because the threats that would come. And each time you walk the ticket line, you'd have people pass by throwing out cars. And I walked those picket lines myself. I had small signs, and I wanted to pick it. I was going to be involved in picketing. Everybody I knew was picketing, and they weren't going to not let me pick it. <laughs> but they throw out little cards to say you've been missing some nice little proof of it. And in our mailbox from time to time, a letter would come in stationery, holy embrace, that said, Nice little proof of plan. They were bold about it. But we learned the right thing to do when that mail came. My mother would go on to the phone, instead of these playtex gloves or latex gloves, mm. and you'd hand them by the corners. And when you opened it, you opened it up very carefully. And the reason being, that letter would be sent to the FBI for fingerprint. Uh, because we wanted to be able to trace back who was making those threats. That's right. That was the environment that those multicultural experiences helped build and grow and shape in the segregated South. And those people that lived in my home and shared everything as if we were part of one extended family would prepare me to class the next day. So when I went in there, I not only wasn't as good, I was going to be better prepared than most of the students in that classroom. Yeah, yeah. The problem was, when you earned that A and B, the teacher looked at you with cross eyes, moved your desk to the front because she was determined to find out how you were cheating. All right? No, I'm cheating. Until one day, a young kid on the safety 
control. Look at over my shoulder, apparently. He tried to see what was on my paper in an effort to get a better grade on the test. The teacher turned around and said, I've got you, I've got you. I knew you were cheating. Fortunately, the other kids in that class said, Floyd wasn't cheating. Tommy was looking at Floyd. Okay. Those are the experiences you never forget. Uh -huh. Those are the challenges that you faced in that day, in that time, in that era. A third of the people in that classroom would look at you with hatred in their eyes. And plead to throw hatred, would brag about their father being involved in the Ku Klux Klan. Another third were absolutely, totally complacent and could not care less. And a third of them would perhaps treat you as their friend and extend a hand to you. Those are the people who you respected. Those are the people who you embraced. They might not have always been the most popular people in the class. It might have been that kid that was the least athletic. It might have been that young lady who because she had a nanny in her home and it come to grow close to that nanny, knew that black people could be good people and had a degree of respect for them. That was what it was like. And I say that to you because it's probably a story that doesn't get told very often. I'm probably the last part of that generation that remembers apartheid here in America, living it, seeing it, breathing it. And I thank God I'm part of that last generation. I thank God that today, all of those barriers to access, so many of them have been torn down. My father and my mother were great champions. When it came to social change, I saw my father not only become a strong, passionate advocate for education, not only for his children, but for all those others that he wanted to open up those doors of opportunity. But he also understood that education wasn't enough, that there were other frontiers, which we had to make certain that those segregated lunch counters, we had to make certain that the accommodations that you stopped at along the highway. I still remember those signs along the roads where many motels would simply say, White Sunday. That's right. White Sunday. And if you were driving from Durham to Asheville before there was an Interstate 40 on Highway 70, there were certain service stations that you could stop along the way in Moxville or other little location where they would let African-Americans use the restrooms. Other places where they would not, but it was known within the African-American community. One thing that I can say is this. My father reached out to many other leaders in civil rights movement across America. Not only was he active in the NAACP legally representing protesters and demonstrations, including the uh, famous ones over in Greensboro that see the notoriety of that in February 1st, 1960, when the students of A&T sat in. Also, was representing the ones over in Durham about three or four years earlier. Thing is, nobody knew about the ones with the royal ice cream in Durham. Why? Because the National Press Corps didn't come and didn't put it on off the front guys. And he didn't sit there and tell you that's the way it is. <laughs> yes. What did they were taking place? They were taking place all over America. Mm -hmm. My father became active with an organization known as CORE, the Congress of Treasury Equality. He became their national chairman. He became their national director years later. The CORE was a very multicultural organization, 